Hi, Matt. Hey, Robbie, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm good. You know, I was trying to get fancy and um, do this on my computer, but it, I don't think it worked. So now we've learned you can't do Instagram Live from your MacBook, I guess. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, I thought it would be easier than the phone because the phone's so little. But we can yeah. do phone. We can do this. We could do it. We could totally do it. How have you been? I was trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, I've been good, man. Um, I've been good. Oh, wait. Now I think I'm on the computer. Wait a minute. No. Okay. Nope. That's not. That's. Yeah. That's... Other people have had trouble with the laptop. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to ditch the laptop. Um, can I go this way with it or no? No. <laughs> I, we're just, you're learning how old and bad I am at this. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm like very, uh, I'm similar. Even on I've, Zoom, I've done some of these on Zoom and um, it's, yeah, it's been a learning curve. I just learned, you know about House Party? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I just learned about that and I was like, I don't want to learn another thing. We've got FaceTime and Zoom and now we got to learn this, but it's fun actually. <laughs> yeah. But I just, I, I've like gotten old. And that's how you know, right? When the internet gets too advanced. That's the barometer. Yeah, that's the barometer. Um, no, we're good out here, all things considered. Um, You're in New York? I'm in New York, yep. Um, I'm in Brooklyn. I haven't been into Manhattan. Uh, this is probably the longest I've gone as a New Yorker without being in Manhattan. And I don't mind it, actually. Yeah? Where yeah. do you live in Brooklyn? I'm in Park Slope. Oh, that's uh, nice. Which is great because I'm right uh, right off Prospect Park. I'm like a three-minute walk to the park. Are you able um, to walk in the park now? Yeah, yeah. You know, they just um, want everybody to respect social distancing. So, you know, I mask up and they've got these. It's so weird how we adjust to a new normal, but they have these giant red signs and it looks like you're in like east berlin in the 80s and it says stay this far apart and they're red signs <clears throat> so you see those everywhere and you know for the most part people are good at it and you know i think cuomo's been really he's made it a point to say you know you don't have to stay inside your house all day and i know different cities and states i'm reading have different attitudes with that and i think here you know, you see people out, um, and I, I don't know. It's just it's everyone's apartments are so small, and so I think people kind of have to get out. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, it's a really good thing to have that park for sure. Um, that is so nice. So nice, and like the weather's getting nice. Everything's blooming. Um, <clears throat> just to like lay in the grass, it's all really great. Yeah, I think it's important. I try and go on long walks or hikes every day. Yeah. You got to. So what do you, you um, what I told, I, I introduced the video by talking about how you're, you know, from San Diego and you've made it to Broadway several times. And um, your mother is uh, a lovely friend, Rhoda Auer, who um, is a lover of Signet and, and her and Mike, uh, her, her husband, like to, um, like to sponsor plays with curse words in the title. I know that. I, and also... It's her birthday today. It is. I it's sent her, her a birthday. text this morning. Yeah, so that's nice timing. And that's why I know you is through her. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, she she likes the she likes the plays with the curse words. She's always been hip like that. Um yeah, and I love this connection. I just I think it's so cool and I think it's like it's just been great to become friends with you personally and it's you know, it's already kind of paid dividends as far as my introduction to Posner and you've played a big role in Wheelhouse now and it's just nice to have like Signet to kind of come home to and when I'm lucky enough to catch you guys in a show um, I love it and you know she, it makes her so happy and I, I just it gives her so much life and she just loves it she loves you guys and she loves being a part of that family um, and actually you know over at Wheelhouse my company I can't tell you how many times I'll be like, well, 
so what I've seen Signet do in the past when yeah. it comes to audience <laughs> cultivation. So like, you know, you're a role model for sure. Oh, that's really nice of you. Um, do you, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey as a creative and um, from San Diego to NYU to now? Yeah. Uh, well, it, I feel like this is probably a lot of actors stories, but it started in high school. Uh, it started because I didn't really fit in in other places, which I think maybe is a common thing with the theater kids. You know, I like, I ran for student government because I was in student government in middle school in a different district. And then I changed districts and I didn't know anybody. And I like was like, I'm going to get involved with student government. And I lost by a landslide. Uh, and then I tried out for the soccer team and that was a disaster. Um, and then, yeah, I think I just wasn't finding my like world. And mm -hmm. a buddy of mine was like, you should audition for Spoon River Anthology. You remember that play? Oh yeah. Every Meisner class, they make you do this. Oh, Spoon River. Yeah. I don't think that's going to Broadway anytime soon. But... <laughs> Edgar Lee Masters. Edgar Lee Masters. It's like the, it's like the, the, music recital of plays <laughs> and you yeah. hope your kids up first <laughs> so you can yeah. speak out <laughs> um, what do you remember what piece you had to do yes i played uh the short lawyer because i was short i was i came into high school really short and i played the lawyer and i remember his opening line he said suppose you stood just five foot two and had worked your way as an office clerk I don't know where it goes from there. But he's, he's angry. He's pissed at the town because they didn't respect him because he was short. And then he pulled something off and helped people. And now he's like, you know, just yelling at everybody for not respecting him. And then I, I did like a couple others. Um, and you're so serious when you're in high school theater. I'm more serious then than I am now about it. You know, everyone's so earnest. And, you, you know, they just, everyone's so committed to their monologues. And, you know, and, and I was hooked. And I, at the time, I was really into science. I thought I was going to go down a science path or maybe uh, be a pilot. Uh, I grew up right by Lindbergh Field. And so I would ride my bike to the airport before 9-11 and like walk up to the gate and meet the pilots. And sometimes I'd get them to like take me along on their pre-flight checks. And mm. I'd go like sit in the cabin. And I love uh the idea of flying in planes. And then uh, my high school teacher, Priscilla Allen, was like such an icon. Um, she's passed away now, but she like influenced so many kids uh, in my high school. Uh, you know, and I fell in love and I found my community and I found these misfit kids that were sweet and lovely and nerdy. And I've never really thought of it before, but I do think there's a connection between the kids who didn't really fit into the big sort of styles of groups, you know, that didn't find their way into kind of a, a click and a, and a bigger, what am I trying to say? Like the kids, like the misfit toys, the ones that couldn't really like make it with the, with the, the jocks or with the preps. And like, they were the ones that were weird. They were the ones that wore like, you know odd socks and like weird vests and like and everybody was accepted and half the kids were gay and like yeah. it was just and i think there's a correlation there between finding that group of people and those people ending up being the people that make theater which is such an empathic art form of, of yeah. open-mindedness and vulnerability and acceptance and i think i've never thought about this but i think there's a reason those kids end up in theater um and i was like crazy and dumb enough to like actually pursue it and so I really wanted to go to New York and against my mom's advice I was like I want to go to NYU mm. and I went and it was it was overwhelming I was 17 I'd never been out of San Diego and it was like winter hit and I was totally unprepared and I was you know you're in the city there's no campus yes. I was living on third avenue and 11th and to be honest I had a tough adjustment and I called my mom and I said, I made a mistake. I want to transfer to UCLA. I want to come home. And you know, she heard me out, but I think was like lovingly um, challenging me to stick with it. Um, and I did. Uh, 
got out, made, you know, non-union downtown theater with my friends for a few years and then got to a point where I thought, uh, I just feel like I didn't get the training I wanted and I wanted to up level my game. And the, the, the field is so hard in New York that uh, I wasn't in the union and I couldn't get an agent to give me the time of day. And EPAs are such a, you know, they're so hard. And I started to look at the actors that had careers I wanted to try to end, well, how did they do it? And I kept seeing MFA, 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 MFA. And I thought, okay, I see the pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd heard great things about NYU. So I thought I'll go back to NYU. Um, so I went back and did the MFA program, which was incredible. Uh, got me what I wanted, got me the, you know, the just, it's, you know, it's so different than undergrad. It's 18 students for three years, basically six days a week, churning out plays with designers. Um, and you're older, and so I think you're more, you have a better sense of a life to draw from. Um, and you're more committed to it, I think. And it's true, when you're 17, 18, you know, you're still kind of like, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. And I think by the time you come back to grad school, you're like, I'm gonna do it. Um, and it was huge, it was a great inspiration. And then I got out of there, did regional theater, did television, did commercials, worked my way, you know, to uh, some Broadway jobs, formed a theater company in the last few years. Um, so it's been, it's been a cool journey. Mm -hmm. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been kind of this winding road. Um, yeah, like you've been you've been doing a lot of commercials. I mean, national commercials. I, I see your commercials when I watch Hulu, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I feel really fortunate. This is this career is such a combination of luck and perseverance like you have to keep showing up but there's also like so much luck uh you know i remember cameron manheim talked to us once and she said it's like a it's like an employer matching 401k for all the work you put in the luck will sort of match it but you have to like you have to go you have to show up but i feel like i've gotten really lucky you know and the commercials are I like them. They're fun. Commercials have turned into like mini movies. Um, mm -hmm. They're dying. <laughs> the whole marketing world's changing. Um, and the idea of capturing a demographic's attention in a 30 second spot is just not how they do it anymore. So mm -hmm. sadly, you know, I feel like with every year that passes, the idea of like really supporting yourself with commercials is just getting bleaker and bleaker, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Because, you know, the internet stuff, you get a lot of exposure, but uh, they're contracted a lot differently. Not to get into the nuts and bolts of how commercials pay, but it's just changing. Everything's changing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, and you went to NYU with some a friend of mine, Lauren English, but also yeah. Nina Arianda. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and Taylor Schilling. Oh wow, we had a good group. Yeah. Um, are you still close with all of them? <clears throat> I haven't talked to them. You know, maybe I've used this COVID time to get back in touch with people and maybe I should reach out to them. You know, I saw Nina a couple of years back. Uh, she's out in LA now, but I did see her when I was doing Matilda. Um, you know, and I've, I've seen her in her Broadway stuff. And so we've, we've caught up at, at bars, you know, the post-show theater bars, but it's been a, it's been a minute. Um, and I haven't really spoken to Taylor. Uh, I think the last time I saw her was on The Daily Show, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you, I don't know the, the answer to this. How did you, so you were the only American actor in the Mark Rylance um, Twelfth Night Richard. How did that happen? How did you get that? Again, showing <laughs> up and luck. It's a, to me, it's a perfect example of those two things. Um, I, uh, so Tim Carroll, who directed those plays, uh, who I just, one of the best directors I've ever worked with, completely changed how I do Shakespeare. You know, you, you, there's so many teachers teaching Shakespeare and so many theories and approaches. And when I heard Tim's whole technique, I was like, sold, done, that's it. And so he created a thing called The Factory in London, which was a, uh, 
a sort of they they took the model off of sports he's a big sports fan and they would do a lot of games a lot of improv and they would approach shakespeare they did like these productions of hamlet and they were site specific and they wouldn't rehearse them they would just play games with the scenes and then they would draw they would draw the casting the night of the performance so they'd be like you know in a a warehouse space and they would draw who was playing what character every night and they would and some there were great moments and there were beautiful failures and so he started a factory in new york uh which my friend miriam silverman who i met doing a play in the berkshires invited me to join them tim wasn't a part of it but it was all of his games and techniques his approach to the verse so i started jamming with them and we would just meet once a week and like learn monologues and just kind of the people that knew it was like it was like oral tradition the people that knew tim's techniques would share them with us and we would just do things together no teachers no students we were all just collaborating and jamming and it was just a way to keep the wheels greased and like play and stay energized and excited and so i i loved it and it really got me excited about shakespeare in a new way then i heard uh about these plays in rep 12 nightmares the third that were coming to new york with the british company but needed one american which i think is a union thing i think when they take a show over there's a little bit of like a horse trade that happens mm -hmm. and i got my sides and i was like oh i'm gonna do the factory tim carroll work on this and i swear to god i didn't realize it was tim yet directing it i just for mm -hmm. some reason i didn't even look down the breakdown far enough and i was like i'm gonna I'm gonna do all this work from factory on this. And then I realized at one point, I thought, oh my God, this is him. This is Tim Carroll. This is like, I'd never met him, but this is the name I would hear. Mm. He's directing it. And so, you know, I think in a way coming into that audition, I kind of had like the playbook. I'd sort I had, I knew exactly how he liked to work and how he liked the verse to sing and what he liked the how he liked the verse to, to his structural approach. And so I think I have a strong feeling had I not uh, gotten involved through my friend Miriam with the factory, I don't think I would have, uh, I don't think it would have clicked. I really don't. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was just, a, it was a weird uh, confluence of, events in my past leading up to something. Oh, and it gets crazier. Uh, I got out to London for a costume fitting, which is crazy. It was cheaper to fly me to London than to bring the costumes to New York. Because, <laughs> because there's so many and they're all these original practices. So they're beautiful and they're worth probably certainly tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's they're, they're it's like real rabbit hats and every you know these they had like you know armenian button makers making the 28 buttons that were going down wow. the doublet so they're like we're gonna fly you to london to fit things and while i'm there they're flipping through this book of the original production of this from 2003 and the same light bulb goes off and i realize i saw this production mm. i saw this production when i was at NYU, when I was studying abroad in London at RADA, our last week at RADA, we all went to the Globe and stood right up front as groundlings and watched the most amazing production of Twelfth Night we'd ever seen mm. with this crazy guy playing Olivia. And again, like my mind just got blown. I thought, and I'm in it 12 years later. It was so weird. It was so bizarre. Oh. And a lot of the same cast, a lot of the guys that I saw in 2003 were revising, reviving their roles. Um, so I like met them and I was like, I saw you in this. I saw you in this over a decade ago. Wow. Do you have any you know, um, stories you feel comfortable sharing about Mark working with Mark Rylance? Mm, yes, working with Mark. He's a lot more, and it doesn't surprise me now looking back, but he's a lot more playful than I thought he would be. I kind of had a feeling he might 
being the kind of guy you just give space to when he's getting into character and he kind of needs his process of of stepping into you know whatever his like journey into the character is and one of the coolest things about him was he's not i mean he's just so goofy and and playful and right up until we're making an entrance you know we'd be backstage uh you know 10 seconds away from an entrance and he's just like making faces and like bringing up like jokes that we were making before the show um he's also like you know he's he's wonderfully uh there's a kind of like a uh the only way to describe it, it's like a pagan spirituality to him like he's definitely the spiritual person but it comes out like in just these weird quirky ways and he's childlike and they had this thing that i didn't really pick up on how it started but i think they called it like the bindle or the bundle it was this big sack full of like significant things that they put into it ceremoniously before they started the production back in london and they hung it above the set backstage and i think mark kind of led this and again it was there was a like a, a kind of um the spiritual component to it they they did a ceremony and they put these significant things in it and it was there to 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 watch over the show and keep things sacred and safe and i learned about it like halfway through the run and then closing night we did our last show we went to brooklyn for some cast party and then at like three in the morning a handful of us took this thing to the banks of the east river and poured like whiskey into the river and tobacco he had this list of things we had to do for the ceremony and then we threw it into the river and like cast it off because our mm. our our time there was done and it was so weird and cool and i think we were all half drunk or fully drunk and it was three in the morning and it was um winter and we were all just sort of howling at the east river um wow yeah yeah he's wild he's wild uh like a lot of the things I saw in Jerusalem, which is where I fell in love with him when I saw that on Broadway. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's so good. And I think there's a lot of him in that role. Mm. I think Jez Butterworth might have written that for him. I could be wrong. Mm. That would make sense. Yeah. But he is, what is it, Rooster? 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 Yeah, Rooster. He's Rooster in a lot of ways. That's him. He loves to party. He's got kind of a weird vibrational connection to the invisible. And he's also just, he's like sacred and profane and he's completely playful. And he also knows his own tricks, which is cool. Mm. Like he knows that, you know, he knows he's, he knows he's got his tricks. Yeah. And he's not precious, which I love. He's not precious. It sounds like an amazing experience. My only story about him was seeing him in Jerusalem and afterwards I waited to talk to him and no one else waited. And I'm thinking this is one of the, this is one of the greatest actors, you know, for stage actors living. Yeah. And um, so we talked for a little bit and then he said, he says, well, you want to go wait for Chris, um, Chris Rock? Because he's just getting out from motherfucker with the hat across the way. And I That's hear that Jay-Z is coming. I just wanted, I really want to, I really want to get an autograph. <laughs> amazing it's like wow what a, i love that amazing. yeah well people wait at the stage door now <laughs> yeah i think it's jerusalem because he'd done boeing boeing but i still think that was sort of like theater people obviously took note but i think it was jerusalem that like by the end of that i think him winning the Tony for it. Oh, and he gave that speech. You remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost feel like that speech brought in yeah. more fame than the play. Yeah. Because everybody, because yeah. it kind of went viral and everyone's like, who yeah. is this guy? And that's classic Rylance. Like, he's not, he's not there to, like, you know, thank the producers. I mean, I mean, he does in his own way, but not at an awards ceremony. I think he just thinks it's all a little, a little more, 
playful man. But I feel like that kind of put him on the map in a weird way. Yeah. That's a funny story though about the stage door. I love that. Do you um um back to you, what are you what are you doing? Do you feel any pressure to stay creative right now? We've talked about this, my theater company guys and I. Um and we go back and forth. I think obviously I feel like there's a lot of different approaches to what's happening right now and sort of I call it the pause. I think we're in the pause. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, at least theater wise, my attitude has been personally um, to sort of take the pause is what I say. And like, I think, I think it's a good opportunity. I think as like an actor and as theater makers, sometimes we get so, our life becomes making theater. So that's our experience of life is making theater so it almost becomes like a hall of mirrors because the things we can draw on is our acting life and our producing life and our designer life and our director life and so i think in a way this is a good opportunity to get off the treadmill of making theater for me and yeah. like i almost feel like i've been absorbing more than creating and trying to filling the well yeah exactly that's a really good way to put it um though i have been sort of doing some interior rearranging of my apartments and like oh. uh which i guess is creative you know i've sort of been like just thinking about the sort of energy of the space i live in um i was like gathering branches in the park to like put up decoratively uh so like maybe my creativity is coming out in like those kind of ways mm -hmm. um but like theatrically, I really feel like for me, I'm I'm filling the well. I think that's really well said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all are. And we're looking to the future going, hmm, I wonder what it's gonna look like. And I wonder if there is no vaccine or a way to come out of this, who's gonna come to the theater? So maybe oh. like you said, having a pause and reevaluating and finding other outlets for your uh, expression yeah for sure it, it's certainly i think there's something amazing about what we're doing now or zoom readings and stuff but it, does, it, it certainly is not theater no. at least in the way we know it <laughs> no it's not theater and it's also making me realize you know, i think back to like my peter brook but i think i think he would say that the necessary element for theater is being in the same room <laughs> You know, even if it's just two people. I think he was like, for theater to be theater, you need two people in the same space. That's all you, that's the only thing you need to make theater. And we, I, mean, I guess we could have it. I suppose you could make socially distanced theater, which might be interesting actually to have. I was like, thinking like, I was thinking like, what if there was like a drive-in theater? Like yeah. we, we stay in our cars, we, we go to the drive-in theater we yeah. tune into the radio station. The actors are in mics. Yeah. You know, that's the only solution I could think of. That, like, there's Why a not? way maybe you could do this in, you know, I don't know. I saw they did drive in church. I think it was in Germany, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And theater's a church, so we could do drive in theater. I love that. Um, but what yeah, is Wheelhouse like, thinking? We're taking the pause. I mean, yeah. we, I think we've all sort of stepped back to fill the well. And we had the same scramble as a lot of people. At first we were like, you know, should we, should we come up with streaming content? Should we do a streamed reading? We floated the idea of the radio play of bringing that back. Mm -hmm. We were like, what if we did a live radio play? And, and then I just think we kind of, for our sensibility, I think we just came to a place where we're like, you know, um, it's the pause and like, we'll be back no idea when um and when we do come back we'll be back and it'll be a new ball game and it'll be really exciting and i think people will be thirsty and desperate i think people appreciate theater more than they ever have but in the meantime yeah. i'm like you know jeff's out building a tree house in connecticut and uh you know um we're reading and connecting with friends and family you know in a way i almost feel like it's like right now we're more in touch with like 
lower needs on the pyramid, staying safe, staying fed, mm. connection with other people. And I almost think the art is, is incubating right now. Mm. And we're just doing things like this, which is so cool. Like I would never have done this with you. Maybe we would have, but you know, mm. my family, we have Zoom hangouts twice a week, which we've never done. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, I think Eric just joined us too. Eric, what's up? Yeah, we're meeting tomorrow. That's nice. One of my favorite, um, you know, uh, for anyone who watches this and is thinking about how, how does theater get produced and made, sometimes it just happens uh, in a living room <laughs> because you were at our play, you were with Rachel and I, and um, you were just talking about Wheelhouse and you were looking, wanting to look for this, a new play. And I think it was Rachel that was like, your mission sounds like you should be doing Aaron Posner plays. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think she immediately sent you Uncle Vanya, yeah. and then and then the next thing I knew, Aaron Posner was emailing saying something like, um, "I thought that when they said they wanted to do it, they were talking like a year from now, but they're talking like in three months." <laughs> so I, I think was amazing. On, I was on the call when he realized that, and Jeff and I <laughs> freaked out. There was just this long pause because we were talking about March and it was January. And he was like, you know, so would your, when would your pre-production start? Like, would you start casting in the summer or the fall? And we were like, no, we start casting like this week. And he was like, wait, do you mean this March? And we were like, yeah. <laughs> and he just started laughing. He just laughed and laughed. And God love him, man. He took a big risk on us. Um, but yeah, I, I love that. That came out of, it was my last night in San Diego. I was hanging out with you guys. And as soon as Rachel said it, I was like, oh my God, we saw Stupid Fucking Bird. We loved it. It blew our minds. We said, this guy's exactly how we like to work. And then like you do, we just kind of moved on and didn't ever connect that again. And as soon as Rachel said it, I was like, oh my God. And I think we had a deadline. We decided we had to have our play picked by January 4th. And I think I was on the plane reading Life Sucks on like New Year's Eve. I think I flew back New Year's Eve because I hung out with you guys the night before. And oh, I landed. Right. Yeah, and I landed and texted the guys. And I was like, guys, because we were going to move forward with the remount of a production of Enemy of the People that we did. Mm -hmm. And we said, if we don't find a new play, we're going to do Enemy of the People. And if we don't have it by January 4th, we're moving forward because we have to. And I texted them and I said, guys, we got to get a reading ASAP of this play right up our alley. Um, and I have you and Rachel to thank. And had we not hung out that night, this play never would have happened. <laughs> and then how did you get Austin Pendleton to be in it? Um, Jeff, I want to say Jeff reached out directly. Um, I think Jeff just reached out. I think Jeff emailed him. He might've gone through his agent, but I know that it was, it was, and they just sat down and they had a meeting and Austin read it and we were, we knew it was a long shot. Um, and he said, yes. And like, we were like, mm -hmm. cool, great. We have Austin Pendleton in our play. Um, and a lot of people said yes, that are like people that I think surprised us a little bit. Um, you know, getting uh, Nadia Bowers was amazing. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Beal, um, you know, uh, we just, we got all of them. I think there were a lot of yeses that we, uh, we were like, well, let's just ask. No harm in asking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was really exciting for us that these people were like, yeah, we'll work with you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back to the thing. It goes back to luck, luck and, and showing Being up. Prepared. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for that play. Well, I, um, do you have a show and tell for us? Do we have a show and tell? Um, like some item you want to tell a story about? in your house? Oh, show and tell. Uh, I do. And Eric's still here, I think, right? I think he's still here. Um, yeah, you asked me to do a show and tell. So I have this. Uh huh. Um, this is a, um, 
Hawaiian doll, in case you couldn't tell. Um, and my uh, grandfather, my mom's dad, used to, he would make these thrift store runs. He loved thrift stores. And he would get us these like knickknacks. And we would always kind of be like, oh, cool, grandpa, thank you. And he was, you know, it was like he felt so good about it. He would just have a bag of stuff and it'd be like tchotchkes and like things that we kind of pretended we were a little more excited about than we were. And so one of them was this, and she wasn't painted at the time. She was just like raw wood. Um, and then like, I don't remember how it started, but there was this joke that uh, I said to Eric, my brother, I was like, well, it was yours. He gave that to you. And Eric was like, no, 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 he gave that to you. That's yours. And I was like, no, no, no. I remember. He said, Eric, I want you to have it. No, no, no. He said, Matt, it's for you. And we went back and forth. And I can't remember who started it, but whoever was like begrudgingly took the doll, then gave it to the other one for Christmas that year, and like wrapped it up. And so like he gave, I think he gave it to me for Christmas. I think he took it and then gave it to me for Christmas. And so of course, next Christmas, I gave it to him. And then he gave it back to me and then I gave it back to him. And then we started to get more like elaborate with our schemes. And uh -huh. he nailed me uh, when I was in grad school and the iPhone came out, the first iPhone. He got an iPhone box. He put this thing in an iPhone box. He got it like sealed in the thin plastic somehow. Wow. And he forged a letter from this like honor thing in society that I won an award from in high school, got their letterhead, wrote this amazingly <laughs> viable letter that said, we've decided to honor all of our past, uh, you know, honorees with a gift. Um, with the release of the iPhone, we'd like you all to have one. And I opened it up and there's this iPhone. And I got so excited that I literally went to the Apple store to get like a case for it before I opened it. And then I opened it and it was this. <laughs> and I was so mad. I was so mad. Oh, that's great. And so then I gave it, so then like, we like, so we've come up with all these different ways to, to give it back and forth to each other. And we've been doing this for probably 15 years now at least and so he makes models he has these model kits uh and he loves working on models so he has all these paints so the last time he gave it to me he painted her and then i gave it back to him and i got him this pair of nikes one year but they didn't fit him and so i was like all right i'll get them in your size next time and so then i added some nikes <laughs> uh, i gave her nikes um so then, so it's back in my possession. So I have to figure out how I'm going to nail him next. Wow. But I love it. It's, it's a cool tradition. That's a great tradition. Yeah. Your yeah, granddad yeah. lives on. What's that? Your granddad lives on for the tradition. Granddad lives on. Yeah, he sure does. Yeah. So, um, Matt, what do you, uh, what do you think, you know, uh, what do you think is going to, theater is going to look like? Do you think it's going to shift at all? Do you think it's going to change? Do you think it'll have to? I think it will have to, yeah. I think, um, I don't think we can know how it's going to change. I think it's one of those things where, I mean, first of all, just from a practicality standpoint, it's going to be weird. And I, I mean, first, we have no idea when it's coming back. And that's a weird place to be. I think we'll be the last thing to reopen. We were the yeah. first to shut down. Um, because even if they say, you know, theaters can operate at limited capacity, we can't afford to. I mean, I don't know if maybe you guys can if you spread out your subscriber base, but we're cutting it close as it is, as you know. So the idea of filling a third of our seats yeah. producers aren't going to do that the ticket prices would have to go up so in that sense i don't know when we're coming back i think it's also there's going to be fear i would imagine yeah. um and then you think about the fact that a lot of our audiences are senior citizens they're elderly people and so yeah. like you said if we don't have a vaccine and our biggest demographic is people who are vulnerable 
I think even when we come back, I'm going to be really curious to see how we gather again like that, which makes me sad. But on the flip side, I do think that people are going to be, uh, are going to be more appreciative than ever. You know, I think people are going to need theater in a way they haven't. I think people are going to maybe be done with their streaming content because mm -hmm. it's all we're doing. We're going to have watched every show. We're going to have binged every series. And I, you know, I think the idea of being in a room, you know, all the things we talk about make theater great, but it's hard to like convince most people that aren't theater goers that that's actually a, a really good thing for your soul. But we kind of have tasted that. So we know, mm. I think people are going to, um, hunger for it in a new way um yeah. and i think it will change how we make theater i don't know how yet you know um but i think we reflect the the energy of the moment we reflect back where our culture's at and and how people are feeling and relating to each other and we're going to be reflecting back a different world we're going to be reflecting mm -hmm. back a sort of regaining of trust of one another and a, a feeling of like what it's like to reconnect. And so I, and I think we can't know how yet because all the magic happens when you let go of knowing what it's going to be. And so I think one of my teachers said, he said, acting is the process of consciously creating circumstances where your unconscious can emerge. And I think, I think that's true. Wow. Right? I love it. I love it. Yeah. Richard Feldman, he's my favorite, one of my favorite teachers. <clears throat> um, but I think that's true for anyone who makes theater. You, know, you can't, I think if you're just thinking up what it's going to be, I gotta imagine you have a similar process as the director. Of course, you have a, you have your initial proposals. You meet with your designers, but people are going to come in, and it's going to change. You're going to discover things, and so I think in the same yeah. way, we're going to discover what the new theater is. Yeah, yeah, that's really smart and wise. Yeah, and you said a lot of good things about you know why theater matters. Yeah, Do I was. You... Um, okay. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I was, um, so in my current play, I'm doing Play That Goes Wrong, which, you know, mm -hmm, for people mm -hmm. that don't know, it's this just ridiculous farce, and there's a lot of laughter, and uh, one of my buddies in the play, it's about, a, it's a play about a play that goes wrong, <laughs> and one of my buddies plays the um, board op, so he's out in the house on his phone, and sometimes he would record little snippets of the show, and like send them to us. And a couple of weeks back, he sent us this sound audio clip of just like a minute of the play and the audience laughing. And like, I honestly, I got really emotional, like mm. listening to an, like a room full of people laughing together. Mm. I got goosebumps and I was like, that feels really far away. Like just hearing, you know, 300 people rolling waves of laughter I was like, oh my God, like what a nice necessary thing and how, how great is that? And I just, mm. I think it's when you lose something that you start to appreciate it more. Yeah. So I'm, I'm I think it's going to be good. What do you, um, I want to end with you talking a little bit about something you're really proud of that you've done in the past. Mm. I think I think the work with Wheelhouse comes to mind. Um, I'm proud that we took really big risks because we really did. And I have a new appreciation because I'd never made, I'd never produced theater before. I'd never been on the side of like, we're going to pick a play. We're going to assemble a team. You know, you do this all the time. And I've, 
I don't think I appreciated just how much the success of a play is not a foregone conclusion at all. Mm. And I know we've had conversations when you've been in the process of something and you're like, I don't know, man, I don't know. Like, I want your thoughts because I'm freaking out. And like, <gasps> I get it because, you know, when we did Happy Birthday, Wanda June, our Vonnegut play, mm. I mean, on paper, that thing was, it's, it's Vonnegut. He's not a playwright and he's meandering and he, in a beautiful way, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't, he's not Arthur Miller. He's not doing big structure. And on paper, it's just, it's weird. And it doesn't necessarily read the best. And so I think for Jeff to like, and half the company was into it, half the company was not. I was really nervous because I brought it to the table and I thought if this thing doesn't, if this tanks and we throw everything at this and it doesn't work, it's just going to be awful and I'm going to feel bad. And, you know, and I, everybody, just, it's, it's terrifying. You probably know. It's mm -hmm. really scary to say, we think this works and we think this is a story mm -hmm. worth telling. And we think you're going to really be moved by this. And you just have no idea. And, you know, you have your friends come in and they give you thoughts and they're going to be sweet and supportive. You just don't know until it hits. And it happened again with Life Sucks, you know, that you just, and with Life Sucks, you know, Vonnegut's, he's not here to give any feedback, but Aaron put a huge amount of trust in us. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it was terrifying. When he gave us the green light, we felt over the moon and we also felt terrified because mm -hmm. we were like, because he even said, he was like, if you guys think you can do this and pull this off in six weeks, go for it. Mm -hmm. And we were all, you know, poor Jeff was just, um, I think I can say this now. I hope I can say this. I think I can. Uh, you know, he, it was just, we were all nervous. And so I, you know, I think I'm proud of those guys and I'm proud of Jeff for, because really he's the one ultimately that had to, the buck stops with him and he had to make the calls and he had to pull the trigger. And um, it's one of the scarier things we've done. And the fact that, you know, when it, when it works, as you know, when it works, it's, it's really exhilarating and it's exciting. So I think mm. that's probably, I'm, I'm proud of, of those guys and that company. And you know, it doesn't always happen this way, but for you, oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. It doesn't always happen this way, but for you it, in Wheelhouse, it seems to, your artistic successes have gone hand in hand with a commercial success and an extension and a transfer. And, and so, that scary feeling, I think, is is always great. I mean, I think the artists live in opposition constantly. And living in the fear is, you know, good. But it also, you know, I've had shows, some of the shows I'm most proud of have made no money. <laughs> yeah. And people have really not understood it or uh, enjoyed yeah. it. Um, and so it's nice that you can have when you, it's nice when you hit the sweet spot and you go, oh, wow, we just, we nailed it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I feel like this is becoming a theme for this, but luck, I mean, I think, again, like showing up hard work and luck. I mean, I think, because we would always say, because we did plays before Wanda June, and I think we had what you're talking about with some of your plays where we felt good about it and people were really affected by it, but beyond our friends and our colleagues and our circle of people, nobody knew. And we kept saying, how do we get, how do we catch lightning in a bottle? How do we, you know, does anybody really want to see our interpretation of, you know, King Lear right now? Like, mm -hmm. and you know, so I think we did kind of catch lightning with, with Happy Birthday Wanda June. And you're right. I mean, it's, it, it's, we got really lucky. For sure mm. and it's cool it's it's neat and it makes it that much scarier because now it's like oh god are we what are the odds we're going to do it a yeah. third time you know mm. um so yeah it's been it's been fun do you have any parting words don't inject disinfectant into your body wise but sunlight's good <laughs> yes it is 
Outside thank you. Matt. Thank you, Matt. All right. Great to see you, Robbie. Always. You too. I'll see yeah. you in San Diego one of these days. I, I hope so soon. Yeah, me too. Bye. Bye.